Today's key readings will be from Genesis chapter 25, verses 19 to 34, and Hebrews chapter 12, verses 14 to 17. Before we read, let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time you've given us to open your word and discover who you are. Father God, please give us your wisdom now as we approach your word. Through Rich, please help us to discern the truth of this text. Thank you, God, for the clarity, encouragement, and hope your word brings. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. The first reading is from Genesis chapter 25, verses 19 to 34. This is the account of the family line of Abram's son, Isaac. Abraham became the father of Isaac, and Isaac was 40 years old when he married Rebekah, daughter of Bethuel, the Aramean from Paddan Aram, and sister of Laban, the Aramean. Isaac prayed to the Lord on behalf of his wife because she was childless. The Lord answered his prayer, and his wife Rebekah became pregnant. The babies jostled each other within her, and she said, Why is this happening to me? So she went to inquire of the Lord. The Lord said to her, Two nations are in your womb, and two people from within you will be separated. One people will be stronger than the other, and the elder will serve the younger. When the time came for her to give the birth, there were twin boys in her womb. The first to come out was red, and his whole body was like a hairy garment, so they named him Esau. After this, his brother came out, with his hand grasping Esau's heel, so he was named Jacob. Isaac was 60 years old when Rebekah gave birth to them. The boys grew up and Esau became a skillful hunter, a man of the open country, while Jacob was content to stay at home among the tents. Isaac, who had a taste for wild game, loved Esau, but Rebekah loved Jacob. Once when Jacob was cooking some stew, Esau came in from the open country, famished. He said to Jacob, Quick, let me have some of that dark red, that red stew. I'm famished. That is why they also called him Edom. Jacob replied, First, sell me your birthright. Look, I'm about to die, Esau said. What good is the birthright to me? But Jacob said, Swear to me first. So he swore an oath to him, selling his birthrights to Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau some bread and some lentil stew. He ate and drank, and then got up and left. So Esau despised his birthright. The second reading is from Hebrews chapter 12, verses 14 to 17. Make very effort to live in peace with everyone and to be holy. Without holiness, no one will see the Lord. See to it that no one falls short of the grace of God, and that no bitter root grows up to cause trouble and defile many, so that no one is sexually immoral or is godless like Esau, who for a single meal sold his inheritance rights as the eldest son. Afterwards, as you know, when he wanted to inherit the blessing, he was rejected. Even though he sought the blessing with tears, he could not change what he had done. Thank you so much for reading, Ian. These Old Testament narratives, they are great fun, aren't they? Thank you for reading. I can see it started snowing outside, but maybe a few minutes of your attention before we go and play uh, in the white stuff. Now, our subject this morning is one that I think um, all human beings find it really, really hard to get their heads around. Instinctively, we don't like it. Instinctively, we reject it. Instinctively, we just don't get it. It. Our subject this morning, we've been singing about it for the last 20 30 minutes, we've been thinking about it. Our subject this morning is God's grace. I was chatting to a friend this week who for whatever reason, was very conscious of their failure before God, longed to be a better husband, longed to be a better father, longed to make more progress in the Christian life. But just like all of us, conscious of how far short we all fall. And because of that, they were just really struggling with the idea that God could love me, that God could love them and struggling to feel confident in God's love because they just felt so undeserving. To which I guess the response is, when did the gospel ever have anything to do with how deserving I am? When did the gospel, the Christian message, ever have anything to do with how lovely I am? 
Uh, maybe you're tuning in this morning as a guest, if that's you. So good to have you with us. Thank you for being with us. Maybe you've been taught to think of the Bible as a set of rules. And uh, maybe, uh, maybe RE lessons or uh, Sunday school in the past, you've been taught to think of these great Old Testament characters as moral examples for us to follow. Well, I'm here this morning to tell you that that could not be further from the truth. Most of these Old Testament characters, they are complete rotters. And the Bible is not a set of rules. It's the story of God's grace to unlovely and undeserving people. And of all the places that we could go in the Bible to illustrate that, can I say, I cannot think of a better place than this story of Jacob and his family. It is impossible to get to the end of this little section of the Bible and think to yourself, oh, what a lovely family. Aren't these tremendous people, salt of the earth? What a great bunch of folk. Now, these are deeply unpleasant people. Uh, Jacob and Esau, they are horrible. Um, I reckon they could um, almost uh, function as brothers from Albert Square on EastEnders. Uh, Get out of my pub. Let's have some argy-bargy. That's the kind of level that we're going to be dealing with, really, over these next few weeks. That is kind of where they are at. And yet, despite all of their grubbiness and their tawdriness and their moral failure, and the fact that they are just horrible people, God's grace is strong and his promises will never let go. Now, just a really quick word on context. Over the past couple of years, as Helen said, we've been working our way through this book of Genesis. And page three of the service sheet this morning gives you a kind of recap of the story so far. Uh, This is the account of, is kind of the the marker that uh, breaks up the different sections in Genesis. So do you remember chapters 1 to 11? This is the account of the heavens and the earth when they were created. Foundational world history. This is the explanation for why our world is like it is. Why everything has gone wrong. Chapters 12 to 25. This is the account of Terah's family line, Abraham's old man, the promise to Abraham to fix the mess. And do you remember Abraham's really wobbly faith living in the gap between the promise and the fulfillment of the promises? Can you remember that? And now chapters 25 to 36, this is the account of Isaac's uh, family line, Abraham's son and his children. Can you see Jacob and Esau? And it's here in this third section that we are most confronted with this truth that we find so difficult to get. And we are confronted with this truth that in my experience, actually most Christians just don't believe in. Point one this morning, God's undeserved grace. Have a look with me, would you, at verse 22? Um, Isaac prays and uh, Rebecca becomes pregnant and then verse 22 the babies jostled each other within her and she said why is this happening to me so she went to inquire of the Lord and the Lord said to her two nations are in your womb two peoples from within you will be separated one people will be stronger than the other and the elder will serve the younger So imagine about 70 years ago, imagine uh, the Queen um, getting a prophecy. Elizabeth Windsor, you are going to have four children. There will be Charles, who's the eldest. Uh, The middle two, is that Andrew and and Anne? Am I right on that? Are they the middle two? And then Edwards, the little boy, he's the youngest. And here's the prophecy. Edwards is going to be the king. And Charles, the eldest, is going to serve Edwards the youngest. And I think we all agree that that would be pretty odd, because that's just not how it works. Throughout human history, the history of monarchy, the eldest always becomes the king, the eldest always becomes the head of the family. And yet, here in this family, and remember that this is no ordinary family, this is 
Jesus' family. And can I say, if you're a Christian tuning in this morning and you're in Christ, this is your family. And yet in your family, what happens? Well, the youngest, it says, well, in, well sorry, the eldest will serve the youngest. And Jacob... He's the one who inherits the promise that God made to his father Isaac and to his grandfather Abraham. And you just think to yourself, don't you, what's going on here? Has God made a mistake? Did God not get the memo? Um, Does God not like big, red, hairy men? Is that the problem here? What's going on? And the way that the New Testament answers that question, really important, is Romans chapter 9. Just have a look at the verses on page 3 of the service sheet. They're on the screen as well. The Apostle Paul, he looks back to your family. He looks back to Jesus' family. He looks back to his family. He looks back to Jacob and Esau. And he says the whole point of Jacob and Esau is grace. God does not choose. God does not save based on who we are or what we do, or how we perform, but merely as a gift that he bestows on some. No reason, no explanation. Simply God's decision to be kind. And we look at that and we just don't get it, do we? We think to ourselves, oh no, this is the bit that I never like when the uh, the preacher starts talking about this stuff. Uh, We like to think that we're in charge. We like to think that we have freedom. We like to think that amazing grace really goes, I found God rather than he found me. Uh, We like to think that it's all about us. We like to think about it's about what I've done. We like to think that um, I figured something out. We like to think that I've got something right, that other people have got wrong. We like to think it's all about how I, what I've earned and what I deserve. And the Apostle Paul, he comes along, boom, he cuts through all of that, and he says, it's all about grace. Can you see the quote there? Before the twins were born, or before they'd done anything good or bad, I mean, how much grace do you want? In order that God's purpose in election might stand, God chose to bestow grace on one and not the other. It is the most humbling truth in the world to accept. The universe would not be any less fair or any less just if Rich Aldrich wasn't one of God's people. Insert your own name there. Rich Aldrich, insert your own name, is not part of the family because he's better or cleverer, or more deserving, or because he made a really good decision and he made a really good choice, but only because of God's grace. God's decision to bestow grace on some. And I realise that that raises some pretty uh, pretty big questions. That's why we have a question time at the end of the series. Why not text your questions in now for in a few weeks' time? But just for the moment, can you see that it's only when we embrace this truth that we can really say, yes, I believe in salvation by grace and not by works? It's only when we embrace this truth that we can have amazing grace in our hymn books. It's only when we embrace this truth that actually we can sing the songs that we've been singing this morning without having the sort of fingers crossed behind our backs at the same time because we don't really believe it because we believe it was part of me. It's only when we believe this truth and we embrace this truth that we can come to church and praise God rather than coming to church to sort of pat myself on the back and do some boasting. Oh, I, I got something right. Maybe we should sing three three hymns to God on a Sunday morning and one hymn to me um, if in some ways I contribute it. Um, I guess if this was a kid's talk, I guess we'd imagine that uh, Charlie and Will over here are in massive trouble financially. They've both run up huge amounts of debt. It's all their faults. They're in lots and lots of trouble. And it's not a perfect illustration, but imagine I've got a check here that's enough to bail out one of them. And in my grace, I decide to give it to Will. At which point, it's not as if Charlie can say that I've been unfair. All we can say is that I've been massively gracious to Will. No unfairness, no injustice when it comes to Charlie or to Esau. They're getting what they deserve. 
just massive amounts of grace when it comes to Will and to Jacob. So can you see the point here? I mean, this is pushing grace as deep down as you can go, isn't it? Not a bit of a him and a bit of me. Not 80-20. Not 90-10. Not 98%. 2%. Not just that he needs to send Jesus to die for me to pay the penalty for my sins. Not just that it's about God's grace and not about my works. But even more than that, in the whole of salvation, even before I was born, God is in charge. It's all him. He bestows grace on some. Very few Christians, I think, who truly believe in grace. I think most of us functionally believe in salvation by works. Most Christians, in some way, I think, will sneak a little bit of works in through the back door, even if it's only 2%. But the story of the Bible is the story of grace from start to finish. You can't get around that. Point one. God's undeserved grace. And then point two, his undeserved grace, and this is the really fun bit, to a very, very messy family. And it's time now to meet the brothers from from Albert Square. Here they are. And the first bit of um, argy-bargy, can you see, comes in the womb in verse um, 22. Um, I think that word um, jostled there. It's a bit of a weak translation. It should really be they, um, they kind of, they were kicking, they were striking, they were smashing into uh, one another which kind of sets the tone really for the rest of the family story Uh, one of the boys he gets called Esau which if you have a look at the footnote means big hairy man the other boy gets called Jacob which means kind of heel grasper or deceiver which I think we have to say are interesting names aren't they can you imagine the school register tomorrow morning big red hairy monster yes miss heel clutcher yes miss And as they grow up, it's clear, isn't it, that they are far from identical twins. Verse 27, um, Esau, he loves his hunting and his fishing and his gaming and his shooting. And it's because of that that Isaac, his father, what a dysfunctional family, prefers Esau because he loves the red meat. But Jacob, it says, can you see it there? Was content, verse 27, sorry, to stay at home. So, you know, picture this. Um, Esau, he's basically like the Bear Grylls figure. He loves the outdoors. He loves lighting fires. He loves killing things. And Jacob, he loves his mummy, and he stays at home to watch the Bake Off. And so it is that one day, Jacob is at home as normal, doing a bit of baking, when the big, red, hairy monster comes in, fresh from the latest episode of filming Born Survivor. And verse 30... Uh, he says to his brother, um, I can't do the accent, bear with me. Hey, bruv, I'm starving. Let's be having a plate of that stew. And uh, can you see the word play here? Can you see the word play? The big red hairy monster, he wants a plate of the red stuff. Can you see the word play? And as you read verse 31, uh, you kind of get the impression, don't you, that Jacob has been waiting for this moment? It's almost as if Jacob has been planning for this moment to come. If, uh, if Jacob was a nice bloke, and if this was a nice family, would he just give his brother a plate of stew? Because that's the nice thing to do. But because Jacob is horrible, and because the family are horrible, what does he say? Verse 31, first, sell me some of your birthrights. And because Esau, he's a man who's totally driven by desire and can't see beyond the immediate, he says, I'm about to die. And you think to yourself, no, you won't, Esau, you'll just be hungry. I'm about to die. Please sell me the birthright. What, sorry, what good is the birthright to me? And without wishing to offend any vegetarians this morning, just looking at Tyr, without wishing to, um, to offend any vegetarians this morning, I am not sure the mention of lentils in verse 34 is meant to be a really kind of positive thing. Isn't it interesting how the writer just leaves that little detail to right to the end? Isn't that interesting? And the big red hairy man trades away all the gold, all the silver, all the flocks, all the herds, not to mention, of course, God's eternal blessing. What for? Plate of lentils. And in time, of course, he will weep over that decision. 
and he will plead for what has been done to be undone. And the writer of Hebrews looks at all of this. That was our second reading. And he treats this whole episode as a massive warning to believers. Be careful, says the writer of Hebrews, that if you're a Christian person, you never get to the stage of trading in the eternal blessings of God for some immediate, tangible pleasure in this life. Maybe you're tuning in this morning as somebody who wouldn't call themselves a Christian. You know it's true. You know that Jesus is who he says he is. You know that Jesus died to pay for sin. And yet, something holds you back from following him. And you never get quite round to cracking on in the Christian life and making that decision. Not because of some intellectual thing, but because of something immediate and short term that you're not prepared to give up. Can you see, it's possible, I think, to be like Esau and to be so focused on the immediate and the here and now that I become defined by my desires and my appetites. Or maybe you are tuning in as a Christian person this morning, but perhaps you live in a city where there's lots of red stuff on offer and perhaps there is the temptation, therefore, to trade in the eternal blessing of God for some immediate desire and pleasure Maybe a financial desire, maybe a sexual desire. And the writer of Hebrews looks at this, don't do it. See to it, he says. See to it that no one is sexually immoral or is godless like Esau, who for a single meal, a plate of lentils, sold his inheritance as the eldest son. Afterwards, as you know, when he wanted to inherit the blessing, he was rejected. Even though he sought the blessing with tears, he couldn't change what he'd done. Don't be like Esau. But as we finish, as we finish, is Jacob really any better? Is Jacob any more likable? Is Jacob any more deserving? In fact, should we, should we stop and have a vote at this point? It'd be really interesting. Um, have, a, have a little uh, play at home with this. Let's have a vote. Who prefers, who prefers Esau? Who prefers the kind of big hairy man who loves the outdoors, driven by desire and appetites? Or who prefers Jacob, the, the quiet man who likes to stay at home and plot against his family? Should we, um, should we have a quick vote? We'll do it in the building. Who prefers Esau? Hands up. Any, any Esau preferers? Who prefers Jacob? Got a, it's not a great choice, is it? It's not a great choice. But you on balance I think I marginally prefer Esau it's not a great choice but I think in some ways I find myself warming more towards him and yet who does God bestow his grace on sneaky Jacob and that's the whole point it really is grace it really is undeserving It really does have nothing to do with you or how you perform. And that is why grace is the hardest thing to get your head around. And that is why grace has always been such a stumbling block and such a scandal. God, I am so stupid. I make so many mistakes. I am horrible to my family. I am horrible to so many people. And yet you sent your son to die for me. And you bestow your grace on me? I don't know. What do you think at home? Is it possible ever to get into the position of just getting comfortable with grace or getting used to grace? Is it possible ever to get to the point where grace doesn't seem an outrage and a scandal? Amazing grace? Yes. Wonderful grace? Yes. Life-changing? Yes. Will it put a spring in your step this week? Yes. Is it the best news in the world? Yes but also just a little bit scandalous.